Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Scott Sugden, Product and Technology Manager. Thank you very much for joining us today. This really exciting presentation about Aliza Dynamic Mixing. Um, we've got two great presenters to uh, to teach you guys how to use uh, internal and external tools within the Aliza ecosystem to create really exciting and dynamic mixes. First and foremost, Carlos Mascara. Carlos, thank you for joining us today. Hello, everyone from sunny and shaky California. We had a earthquake a few days ago, so I need I need to feel it. You know, I, I'm I'm not awake right now. It's very early here, but I'm happy to be here. Excellent. Thank you for joining us, Carlos. We'll do our best to make sure there's no more earthquakes. Um, from <laughs> slightly less shaky and slightly less sunny uh, Paris, France, uh, Frederick, your mic is still muted. And three, two, one. Thank you for joining you us. You can't say less sunny look in my town. I look fantastic. And the good thing is here in Paris, here in the headquarters of Marcoussi and in this very Elisa room, we don't have any earthquake, Carlos, because I I don't play music as loud as you do. But oh, uh, we'll, nah. <laughs> we'll be happy to talk you through some really advanced techniques in the mixing uh, in object-based mixing with Elisa. I believe you followed the previous uh, webinars. You're going to learn more. Up to you, Scott. Excellent. Thank you. And uh, helping out guys answer questions. Marcus Ross, thank you uh, for joining us with your 17,000 guitars. Um, we're looking forward to seeing the drum kit next week. Marcus is going to help answer in the moderation. Thanks for joining us, Marcus. Uh, good morning, uh, everybody. Uh, always happy to uh, be a participant of the uh, of the webinars. And as always, really uh, looking forward to listening to Carlos and Frederick discuss the technology as they're so, uh, so amazing at it. So good morning, everybody. And Marcus, obviously, uh, if you guys have not been a part of one of these webinars before, he can help answer in English and Spanish. And Sylvain, who is really trying hard to be a part of the mix, um, is joining us from, it looks like, inside of Eliza. Sylvain, thank you for joining us inside of Eliza today. <laughs> Hi. Yeah. I'm uh, so to help today for answering two questions in uh, English or French. Excellent. Well, thank you, Savas. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, Frederick, I'm going to send it back to you. And I think uh, you are uh, going to start us out with just a little reminder of all about Eliza and object based mixing and specifically, obviously, dynamic mixing. Of course, that's where we're going to start, uh, Scott. So, doom, doom. Uh, I would say that in the uh, previous episodes, we learned a few things. We learned that Elisa was not just one processor or was not a plugin, was not, it was a full system approach. And it started out with designing a system, a speaker system in Sound Vision with the Elisa tools and the Elisa ballistics to get the best possible score so people sat in the shared zone would all hear what the mixer is mixing and would all hear positioning um, in conjunction with the visual. So what you see is what you hear. And then this uh, magnificent speaker layout would be imported as you can see in Elisa. And uh, from what you can see here, there's the scene, the performance area, and this performance area, as you probably remember, is covered by five speaker minimum. And this is called what we call the scene system. Then we have the extension speakers to both sides. So they provide an, a panorama extension if you have very long rooms. And then we have all around here a surround system. We could have elevation on the top. And you import those speakers, and this is very important for your processor to process the Elisa mix in the end. Right, so the change was in the workflow. We're no longer using just the desk. We're using a desk here, but no longer are we using the master fader. The program goes into input channels, then you connect to your controller, which is running on your personal computer, be it uh, Mac OS or Windows 10, and this is connected to the processor. So then you'll input some parameters for the channels that are going to come in the processor through direct out from the desk into the MADI inputs of the processor. Then right out of the outputs, 
the processor knowing where the speakers are, where the objects are, is going to manufacture the ELISA program, providing every hang here. I'm only describing the uh, scene system, the five hangs you saw, with discrete outputs from the processor. So we have discrete, not interfering outputs. Right. So transitioning from stereo to object mix had to be easy in our way. The overcode, the user interface, had to be easy, although it gets deep into technology. The task for the mixer needed to be made easy, and for that, we implemented few parameters. Let's say four parameters. The first one is the one you're used to. It is pan. So you pan in your Elisa world, and knowing that every speaker is heard by every listener in the shared zone, you can pan now. The second parameter, if you remember, was one that was assessing the fact that we were so accurate that sometimes you needn't have an air pin. Uh, I mean, a, a sound that's, that has the size of a the size of a hairpin. You need to expand it. You need more of a mass. You need something that's wider than just one mono source and for this we've implemented width and with width you distribute the energy of one object over more adjacent speakers then we implemented distance and distance was just a very natural way to evoke an object going away from you so it's three things it's a level drop and we're talking from front to back a 20 db drop but with a very natural curve and with a very natural curve both for designers and listeners as the object moves away from you but also for mixing engineer because it really resembles a theta curve which feels so natural to us and then if you have any if you're in a dome maybe you have elevation speaker and for this we have an extra pan range here, a pan fader that takes the object into the elevation. So four parameters to go object base in ELISA. Then, if you remember, we have the room engine and the room engine is built in the processor. It looks very much like a reverb and it is a reverb, but it is a cohesive reverb for all objects within your session. And it actually creates a space within your Elisa dimension, a cohesive space. And what you have to remember is when you're touring, shapes and sizes of your room can be different. And what we want with Elisa, we want to be absolutely sure that wherever you are sat, you are hearing this green wave front, which is the direct signal before you hear any room engine. So direct signal first and then the room engine will come and hit you. And it is very important so you keep the localization of the object where they are. And this will guarantee so the dry signal to arrive first wherever the object is in your Elisa world and wherever you're set within the audience. And it, it, it adapts to frontal, surround, and 3D systems. And it will adapt to venue size and shape, again, by importing your speaker from your sound vision design. So last thing, object position control can be handled directly from the controller, either by grabbing an object and moving it around in the soundscape, which is your main view here, or by using snapshots that are directly built in the, con the controller. Then if you're being given a, a desk that is capable of DeskLink, and remember DeskLink is an open protocol that manufacturers can implement into their desk if they wish so, and it is it has been successfully implemented yet with the Digico people, and it's soon to be released, and it's quite uh, remarkably done also with the people from Yamaha on the Rivage series. So SD series by Digico, Rivage series by Yamaha. And the desk becomes a remote of your controller. Then we have a plugin. 
And that plugin is not doing any audio. It's just finding here the same parameters than in your um, in your controller and having the ability to write automation in any do. When I say any do, it's uh, AX for Pro Tool, it's audio unit, and it's VST3. And by the way, because it's AX, it will also fit in the S6L uh, series from Avid. So that plugin can be incorporated into your channel script. So from your X6L, you can control the parameters of objects from the desk. Then if you have any, you can build some custom interaction with OSC, and I believe that uh, Carlos will extensively describe that. So any, Touch OSC, Lemur, I'm only naming a few using, or uh, anything you program that can be fancy gloves with buttons or sliders that you use with OSC to manipulate some parameters. Your imagination is the limit. And then if you have a control uh, show software like Modulo P or like uh, here QLab, you can ex extensively uh, control the uh, controller from those um, software. So you can go in the deep of the arcanes of the controller because the controller, you have to remember that natively speaks OSC. Then the last thing you want to play with if it's there, if there's a video team that's exploiting a, um, a tracking solution, then you can get some very valuable uh, positioning data that you will turn into metadata for your objects. That's all you can play with, and there might be more. And that's what we're going to cover today. But all these will speak only to the controller because you have to be able to filter those and to decide what object responds to what modifier. And that can only be done if the controller is your gateway to the processor. So the controller speaks and controls the processor and every other modifier speaks to the controller. That's the gateway to any modification. Right, let's go into uh, some dynamic mixing. Let's here. So I'm going to take this session, which is an Elisa session. So I've imported some speakers and I've created some objects here. You can see if I select them, they highlight. And there's also groups that have been created, like a all string groups. And a group, remember, is just a, um, a safe multi selection of object. OK, it has no coordinates. The object have the coordinates, but the group itself is the sum of all objects. It's a quick way to recall a multi selection. And that's what I've done with the strings. But here, there's not only strings, there's more than that. But we're going to focus on string in orange and on the red dot here, which is the soloist. But we'll come back to this. Um, so what can we do? Obviously, I can select an object and move it, but when it goes to dynamic, sometimes I want to program things so I can play them back. And the first thing, and that's very important to understand that it is within the Elisa controller, is the snapshot. So what is a snapshot? So if I select all these guys, a snapshot is a photograph, an instant photograph, and I'm going to create a new snapshot here of all objects with a given parameter. Let's do another one here and let's bring width down. Let's create a new one and I have two snapshots and I can recall them with different positions and different settings in my box. And here I played a bit with width, but that's a different in status. So you're storing every object that is in your session, not just a few. You're storing every object with all their given parameters, right? And what you then can do is instead of jumping from one to the other, is you have here something called crossfade, and it gives you, say, four seconds. It gives you a very smooth transition between the snapshot I am on to, the one selected in blue, and the one I'm going to be on to, which is selected in orange. 
So let's transition. Okay. So this is it. This is an instant photograph of all members, and I could actually take all members and display them and maybe create a third uh, a third one. Uh, sorry. Here. And now I have different settings for all the members of my orchestra. They're all moving. OK, so it's a photograph of all members with all their given parameters. Now, what is it good to have um, snapshots for? Right in this track, and I'm going to show you maybe a picture of it. In this track, I have an orchestra. As I've explained to you, I've got a flute player and I've got a full orchestra around it. So let's come back to our session. What I want you to focus on to is these orange guys. These orange guys, and I've created a group for them, are the strings. And as you can see, they're behind the flute player, which is this guy. They have a certain distance, so contributing to the room engine, and they have a certain width too. And they're creating a bed of strings. So that's a very coherent, and it comes as one mass of uh, strings. One very large and smooth mass of strings. But at some stage in the piece, the concertmeister, who's this guy, is going to have to play a duet with the flute player. So in a stereo world, in a bus mix world, what I'd probably do is I'll ride my fader. And if it is accessible, I might trim down my reverb or not. Might re something, I don't know. You never know. Right. I propose that since we've got snapshot, we could actually take this concertmeister here and move him to the front. So he matches the depth of field that the flute player has. And maybe I'm going to drop the width because I want something very precise, right? And that would be probably a first position, which I saved here. And I could move from the bed of strings to this solo position. So the contribution is I get a little more level. I might get a slight tonal change because of the HF filter that's being applied when you move back. And moreover, I'm going to get a very different contribution to the room engine because bringing it to the front is going to excite less of the room engine for this specific object. Now, my sound designer thinks it's too precise. It's too defined. Maybe I could still keep his panorama and keep a bit of width and have him there. That would be another option which I saved here. Right. So that would be an option for a less defined solo, keeping really the panorama and moving him forward. So a slight change in level. Slight change in tone and possibly slight change in room engine, depending on your settings. And then once he's finished with his solo, he will move back and contribute again to the bed of the track. So it is a very easy way to underline a solo bit, right? So one element can have a hot spot like a one position and one type of setting that is worth for solo. And it might come back ever so often during the show. So you could have one snapshot to move this specific object. This goes a bit against nature, because when I think about it, I said that I was storing every member of the session. And now I'm saying I'm trying to recall only one move. Well, I can do it, but what I'm really doing in Elisa when I recall a snapshot, I recall all the members that are listening to the snapshot recall. And this is here defined in the logic, in the control logic. And you see all objects here are and are listening to the snapshot data to define their position. So when I recall a snapshot, 
I'm actually recalling every position and I only have this guy moving, so it works. But there could be another way because I'm recalling everything, but actually what I could do is recall less, but I would need to do it externally. And that's where desk link, our protocol with the desk, is of use because you can see that here I'm finding the parameter right on the desk, but that is only one thing. The desk has snapping snapshot possibilities. And not only does it have snapshot possibility, it has scoping possibility. So when you recall, you can actually scope the things you want to recall. So if you've got several solo elements, you could decide that only the ELISA position will be recalled and you have a hot snapshot, which could be uh, put on some macro keys or on some quick calls to assess this. And the way you scope here, it's fully integrated in, in the engine. And you can see that here, first violin has only the external here engaged in the um, recall scope. So everything else will be ignored for all members of the session, but the ELISA parameters for this specific object, which was my object. Okay, so scoping can be done in a desk link capable desk. Right, another example, because that's one thing. I'm underlining a solo with a change of position. Now I have a pub band, you see keyboards to the left, bass, two BVs, a singer, drummer, and a guitar player. Okay, so let's load this session, if you would, if you let me. Right, here's a new session, boom. Right, I have done a very nice balance of it, and it's really an enthusiastic piece. It's really emotional, and my task as a sound designer and as a mixer is to translate this emotion to the audience. I have much more objects than this. If you want to see them all, look, I've got many things. I've got BVs here. I've got effects coming back from the desk because yes, I have a room engine, but this will not prevent me to have a gated reverb on the drums or uh, an early reflected uh, room on some percussion or whatever that still comes from the desk and it gives you some extra object into the session. So I'm going to neglect this. What I want to show you is here, I've got the singer. Here in orange, I've got the drums. There's more than that to the drums. If I select the group, you're going to see them. Here in green, there's a piano, two sides. And then in pink, there's a stereo keyboard playing strings and pads. And here, that's the bass. That's my session. Now, in the old days of um, mixing in stereo in the studio, we used to play between very mono or centric uh, development, say on, uh, say, uh, verses, and then your song would expand in stereo and maybe wider if with a few tricks to really lift people up on the chorus. And that chorus would be something very obvious that he, that requires more air, more expansion, more stereo. We never used to do that in the live situation because we couldn't pan things hard pan would only be valuable for a certain amount of people. But now in this room, I made sure by design that the speakers would, would be covering of the widest possible shared zone. So now what I can do is I can decide my intro and my verses will be more intimate. So the intro is uninteresting on the drums. It's only a kick drum, a little bit of um, hi-hat, I want to move the drums back. Then the piano, I would like the piano to, to be more beatly, so mono somewhere, right? And then the strings, they're only playing a few notes as pads. I would like to be there mono somewhere else in the panorama. 
So I'm going to create a first snapshot and you see my drums have moved back. My piano has the same panning for each side of left and right. And now the pad is only one point. I brought them out to a very monoish um, example uh, sound. Here, 40 is the acoustic guitar because the acoustic guitar player really comes near the singer for the intro. He will later join his original uh, place. So we have something that's really, really more centered on three speakers, if you'd like. I'm neglecting one and five of scene, although there might be a bit of room engine to it. And I'm completely neglecting the extension speaker. So I'm really centered right in front of you. And I belong to the center of stage, although I've got I mean, this could sound already as large as stereo. Then in the, um, the first verse, the drums come forward. So boom, another move. So the drums come forward. There's a bit of width on the um, on the overhead, so they don't sound too pinpointy. But the piano is still a mono point. The strings are still a mono point and the guitar is still to the center near the singer but there comes the bridge and that's where we want to lift people up not to give them the full blast but already open up this image so what i'm going to do is i'm going to open up the, this piano i'm going to expand the two objects of the synth slightly so i create not a mono anymore synth but something that's wider but really still belongs to the center and it's low key strings so that's what i'm going to be doing have a look next snapshot so the piano is expanding and the strings are filling the center look the piano is expanding but the parameters are different although it's a stereo object parameters are different this guy is to the extreme left this guy belongs to the center so when you think about stereo, stereo objects were filling the space, and that's exactly what I'm doing. One object is to the extreme, and I've put width into it because I don't want it to be hyperlocated. I want it to provide a bit of panorama extension here. And here, the piano belongs to the center. He goes back in the room engine and a little less level, but he still is a counterweight to side left of the piano. Right, and the guitar player has joined his spot, his sweet spot, and then there comes the chorus, and that's where we not lifting up, we're literally flying with wet eyes because the strings are going to the top notes, and they must be the widest thing in this mix, and it will help lifting the track up and making it fly. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. So those two objects are going to the extension speakers. You can see that there's a bit of width to, to, uh, to be filling the outside of stage two and to be less localized. But right now, if you want to have a look at my full image with full object, I'm filling the space. So I'm filling all seven speakers so i've really done a panorama extension and expansion from a very centered monoistic uh, balance to something that expanding that really lifts the the crowd it this is really an emotion creator and what you have to think is it's not because you have seven speakers that you have to use seven speakers all the time please feel free to pan feel free to expand or to retract this is really important to do right and you can certainly remember that here i can recall these snapshots either from osc or from MIDI program change, or from MIDI timecode, right? And you have to remember that, and I'll take a last session here. Um, you have to remember that uh, it's only small changes. I'll take a 360 session. It's only minute changes so when you take this guy you you have a first snapshot so first snapshot then you send him 
So I'll type it in. I paid my figures today. Uh, I pan it 10 degree. I have an extra 30 degree of width and I'll add 50 of distance. This is going to be a new one. So I've got two snapshots, the first one and the last one. And it really wants you have a smooth cross fade. You can see that the values are going to ramp up to their from their initial value to their last value, their final value, and it really is a linear move. So that's something that is very, very simple as a move individually, and that's what you have to think about. One object is moving with a small and linear move, but that's only one object. If I take, say, I've got 14 flutes here all around us, and it's a 360 system, right? They're all in their final position. So I have this snapshot. Let's create one snapshot. OK, and then all these should retract as I did. But let's make it even more dramatic. I'm here re initializing pan, no width. And as far as the distance is concerned, I'll take it to the right back so far in the room engine. Because actually what my sound designer said is it would be perfect if I had 14 flutes and they would suddenly bloom from a blossom to a full flower of flutes. You know how can uh, poetic they can sometimes be. So we have this guy and we have that guy and see this one should be before so this guy should be here and now if i enter something like a 20 second um crossfade time moving from the blue one to the orange one will spread all, flower, all um, flowers, I would say, all flutes from their blossom to all around the audience. And for each element, there is a change in level, there's a change in tone, and there's a change in the room engine contribution. This is massive, and this is really as easy as what I've done. Is you take all objects, you take them to only one spot and expand them back. Isn't that dramatic, Scott? Isn't that uh, quite a dramatic effect and emotional effect? Yeah, it's, it seems like it'd be really interesting to to think that way, um, you know, and 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 give yourself that palette or that tool set of of mixing and creating with with those kind of things. Um, and, and the nice thing is, Frederick, is is at this point, it's it's the choice of whether or not that's a good artistic choice, right? Uh, you have the tools available to you, and and that. That 10 seconds of work for you to make that snapshot turns out might sound amazing or it might be a terrible idea, but it only took us 10 seconds to give it a try, didn't it? Exactly, and you would know. And uh, that's a very, very easy and quick answer to your sound designer. I want this. Can you make it happen? Well, our solution is really, really, really quick for this. And remember, it's within the software. I'm only using what's inbuilt in the controller, but they could be more, but it takes external tools. And I think that Carlos is going to lead us through this. Carlos? OK, sorry. Let me <laughs> take control. I'm, I'm back. So I hope you're seeing my screen. We is are, it? yeah, thank you. Uh, OK, that's cool. Uh, well, I feel kind of bad because your session is colorful, you know, like a flower. It looks beautiful. And mine is just like a soulless three objects. You know, I need to do something about it. Um, but I don't know, maybe because you're French, you know, you're like more Frenchy. I don't know what that means, but it sounds funny in my, in my mind. Anyway, so... <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'm gonna... Um, go deeper into what you're saying. Uh, I'm going to actually show, I'm going to work with Pro Tools right now. I'm going to go in the plugin side because we can control objects from DOS, from any DOS you mentioned already. In this case, I have a you know a basic Pro Tools session. I have uh, audio tracks, MIDI tracks, and 
OSC tracks. I mean, they don't have any audio, any waveform, but uh, we have automation lines. Let me show it here quickly. So these guys here are controlling are controlling Elisa, all uh, time based. So let's say well we have a dedicated plugin which is uh, this little guy looks beautiful and you can select which parameter you want to control so actually let me do it for you quickly here to show you how uh, easy it is i'm going to create a a track an audio track this is my plugin i'm gonna let me find uh, okay so i'm gonna Control object 12. Uh, so enable here. I need to create my object first. I forgot to do that. I'm going to select plugin here and pan. So if I go back here, uh, now it's green. We're talking to Alisa already. So that's, that's it. I can now um go here oh wait i haven't enabled my so here i have to select which parameter i want to control so i'm going to go with pan now for now i can do anything with distance elevation accent all of them so here i can go and you know create my beautiful automation line to control lisa so if i go and you know, I'm gonna yeah, I'm gonna select a random movement. So if I play this, as you can see, this movement is controlled by Pro Tools. Actually, you know, now that I feel bad, let me add some color to just this one. See, now it's beautiful. Thank you, Fred. Um, and as you mentioned too, it's bi-directional, so I can literally just go to um, to write mode. I can press play, and now I'm writing automation. So if I move it, I just wrote it. So and again, and I can play it back. And it's as easy as, as you can see. It's just this. And this is all you know. You can do in real time. If you have time code coming from stage, you can easily automate uh, movement or width or you know elevation, any kind of parameter you want. And you're gonna follow what the you know the music is is taking you to. Um, so yeah, that's that's plugin. Um, I have. I'm actually controlling Elisa um, using. Uh, MIDI as well from here. Uh, if I go to my MIDI program changes, here you s maybe you don't see it, but I have numbers, and these numbers are triggering um, snapshots on Elisa. So, for example, uh, here it says two. If I play from here, uh, now it's on two. Actually, let me. In this case, I have snapshot two. And the snapshot one, the snapshot one is uh, taking all my objects to the front, and and number two is taking my objects to the back. So if I go to one here, it's gonna they're coming to the front, as you can see. And to the back, I decided to you know to make it in five seconds, so we have a crossway time, as you mentioned as well. And if I play it from here, it's gonna take five seconds for my objects to go from snapshot one to snapshot two. That's it. Even from Pro Tools, I can do that. So again, yeah, any MIDI or OSC device can talk to Alisa. And we found that like, this is very important because we're in a creative environment. So we have lining people, visuals, we have, we have you know, it, it's, uh, it's an entertainment industry. So we have to entertain. And for that, we have to talk to each other. We have to make a, you know, just one environment. And that's that's what that's what we chose OSC and MIDI to. Uh, to me, OSC um, um, is more well. It's a 
to me it's like a, a modern MIDI, like a, it's optimized for uh, modern technologies, like networking technologies. And you can send um, this data uh, over a network. So, so Carlos, what, what you're saying is that Pro Tools session could be on the same computer as your controller or another computer in the show, right? Correct. Yeah, you can actually control Elisa from the stage. If you're a musician and you want to take control of your mix, why not? Like you can specialize and do it however you want. And then the mixing engineer can take over and do whatever he wants. So it's like, you know, this is actually a good uh, communication between both the artist and the mixing engineer. Um, so yeah, uh, well, I have audio in this case. You can, you can enable at least a um, uh, plugin to control from audio track as well, having audio on the track, so there's no problem with that. We actually have shows where the artist, you know, play from stage and we have Pro Tools running or any door running just with automation because you're, you know, you're locked to time code. Um, all the automation that is happening is coming from from your dog. Um, so OSC, OSC is actually really, really interesting and powerful, we'll say. Um, so there are different softwares that, that can talk, that can do OSC. And one of them is Max MSP. Uh, it's, it's actually, I don't know if you're, maybe you're not familiar, but Max MSP is a, it's a interactive software. It's, um, it's media software with tools for audio, graphics, and communication. It's, it's very popular in the, you know, modern music. Contemporary composers use it often. And it looks like this guy. Uh, so this is a basic patch. It's slider and two objects. Um, so actually, let me just move this slider and you can see the object is moving accordingly. My slider uh, is up outputting uh, values from zero to one and this object is taking this string and adding these values to send it internally locally to Elisa. But, and well, that's OSC basically. So you need to have an ID, you have to have uh, an address, what we call, and Elisa provides you um, that API. So if you go to help, uh, let me move this here. You go programming, uh, external OSC control or an OSC API, you can see all the address that you can use to talk to Elisa. You can, you know, you can, you can control so many things. Uh, right now we're using uh, this one actually. So this is an example. It means like a, an external device, uh, actually we're not using this one, we're using this one. An external device is controlling source number 16 and P for, for PAN. Maybe you don't see, I don't know if it's big enough, but it says external source 16 P 0 0.3. In my case, it's external device controlling source number one and P for pan, but I can easily change this here. Instead of P, it's going to be, I don't know, D for distance. And if I move my slider, there you go. So now I'm controlling distance. And this is done um, after, you know, after I make this combina combination between address and values, I'm sending this via UDP locally using the port 8880, which is the fixed port for Elisa. And this is a basic patch. I can you know, show you something a little bit more complicated. Complicated. This is a, this is a LFO. Um, I made it from scratch. And with this, I can automate Elisa as well. Right now I have four different waveforms. Sine wave, so square and triangle. I'm going to take the sine wave. I'm going to connect this to the slider. And now I'm, as you can see, I'm automating distance just like that. Um, I can do the same, you know, with the saw tooth 
waveform. And now you're seeing a different kind of movement. So anyway, it's as easy as you can see. Um, I'm, I'm multiplying for 127 right now because I'm controlling the slider, but I've, I can go straight from here to here because these are values from zero to one as well, and you're going to see the same. Um, if I, actually let me, let me turn this off, and now I'm going to go with something a little bit more complex. The leap motion is a motion sensor is actually, I don't know if you can, this, this guy here, I've used it uh, for different tours. Throw that, uh, hey Carlos, throw that back up on screen. I just, just got your camera up for that, so everyone to see you, that leap so motion. This little guy here is a motion sensor. I've used uh, uh, plenty, like several times for different tours, different shows, and it's a very natural way of controlling sound in real time. If I enable, if I turn this on, I, you're going to see my object movement. Are you, can you see me, Scott? Yeah, that's great. That's okay, really cool. so I'm, I'm moving my hand, I'm waving my hand, and my object is following uh, the movement, which is cool, no? So, uh, besides it's cool, if like, it depends what the, the artist is doing on the stage in the moment. So you can follow it because art, you know artists do sometimes whatever they want <laughs> in their concerts. So I can follow it for a specific uh, mov uh, movement. Yeah. So it's a pretty cool tool. What I'm doing right now is I'm converting the language that this leap motion is doing and scaling down from 300. You know, like the uh, the leap motion is is sending values from 300 to from minus 300 to 300 and scaling that down to zero to one, which is what Elisa can read. Um, and as you can see as well, the values are coming here and sending that locally again to the port 8880. So Carlos, what you're saying is um, for everyone who's watching us live, the math classes they took 20 years ago <laughs> are now relevant for uh, their daily life, right? So you got to do some algebra again. Is that what you're saying? Uh, sure, that's what I just said. Yeah, yeah. Okay, got it. Totally. Excellent. That's what I just totally said. what you said. Excellent. Yeah, I actually I thought about it, but in Spanish, so that's why I couldn't, you know, take it. Okay, so uh, that's Max. I mean, you can get like really more complex visually, some graphics, some uh, interesting pedals, uh, keywords, even MIDI. You can convert MIDI into OSC and create interesting stuff because you cannot only uh, control pan again you can do anything like elevation you can do distance and midi wise as, as, as i show you you can control snapshot so you can get really really creative uh, with elisa because again i see it as a creative tool i don't see like a technical one um because the idea is to feel you know uh, comfortable like you can use it right away as you can see it's very intuitive like this is a top view of the of the system place the object where you want and you're gonna uh, hear it accordingly when you have a you know, bunch of speakers in the concert or uh, you know like maybe surrounds maybe overheads anything you can do whatever you want uh, another option is tracking so we have different um, uh, we have different um, ways of uh, tracking uh, objects or well sorry tracking people or tracking any movement movement uh, thing and so Carlos what you're saying is um, there's technology out there that we can use to locate something in the real world right and is that that the idea like um, uh, maybe a lighting guy has an automated tracking solution so the spotlight follows around the lead singer that's correct um, yeah, that's one of what well, one of the things, one of the ways of doing it. Uh, it's kind of scary that the lightning guy is controlling your object, but that's that's the beauty of it. Like you can take over, or if you know that light is gonna be there all the time, why not? Like he can take it, take over, and it's gonna relieve like some um, 
uh, work that the engineer or is, is, is actually making just one ecosystem. And that's what I like about this is, is everything is working together. And that's very important in the artistic world. Um, so yeah, we have different protocols right now. Uh, RTTRPM from Black Tracks is that what I'm using right now. We have PSN as well, but I'm going to show you how RTTRPM from Black Track works. Black Tracks. Um, I have a source simulator right now running. Um, so if this is my object too, I'm just going to turn it on. And as you can see, my object starts moving. So this is simulating a person on stage or anything moving, any anything <laughs> moving. Of course, you have to have a tracker. Um, and it's simulating someone moving on stage. I can show you here in a 3D environment how it, that looks. Uh, this is cool. You can have all the trackers you want. And of course, we have 96 objects that you can track, but right now you're seeing just one object in your space, in your 3D space. We have a, a three dimensional movement right now. Uh, of course, we have only a 2D, but you know what? We can create another speaker on top of us. Let me make it here. So I'm going to enable my 3D view Woo! here. And as you can see, there's some movement here on the elevation side. You can, uh, you can hear, you can see it here right now. But I mean, if you want to actually go on top of you, I can either change my movement here on the source. Um, I'm going to make it minus 15. I'm going to update that. So Carlos, what you're doing right now is using, is this the test tool from Black Tracks to send out tracking data? So it's pretending as though there's an actor who is flying across the room. Um, and that data is being sent to Elisa, just like it would as if this was really during the show, correct? That's correct. Yeah. So right cool. now, uh, I'm, I'm using like a more extreme uh, example because sure. we, I want to show like we can do so much, not just a track, you know, not just a singer moving on stage. We can do way more than that in a 3D environment. So right and now. You can have what? You could have multiple trackers running at the same time. So as a sound designer, it'd be really hard for you to. Well, that's a pretty crazy movement. So when does the actor throw up? That's the question. <laughs> right about there. Totally. Huh? Yes. Okay. So well, right now we're seeing the positive, you know, movement on the vertical plane because right. I have elevation. I can actually let's do that. Uh, I'm gonna add a under under seat speaker like it's under you and. Right now, I'm having a 3D environment in a 2D screen, which is actually uh, not easy to do, but we found this is the best way to do it. Now I have my frontal system, I have my overheads, and I have my under seat uh, speakers. So you can see all of the movement in just a 2D screen, or if you want it, you can see it on a 3D screen. So we have these two options. Cool. Yep. Um, and this I works with black tracks. This works with what stage tracker two um, works with Zach tracks. It works with anything that does PSN data as well. That's correct. Yeah, I can actually change my origin right now. Th this is my origin here and maybe black tracks has a different origin. I can manipulate this, you know, go back and change my origin because I don't want to change Black Trust origin because they're doing their thing maybe with lining, maybe with some automation, but I can actually change that on my on my end. The oh, cool. whole so idea, it, the whole oh, idea Scott, is what we're seeing here with the orange diamond is actually the um, the 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 position 
the physical position, the absolute position. Now, when you're doing video, when you're doing lighting or when you're doing sound, you might expect to treat this position slightly differently. And this is where it was very important for us in the ELISA equation uh, by incorporating how we were tracking elements to be able to define where the origin was, to define the the um, the axis. If you were, if one origin was sent to the back, whereas ours would be needed to the front, you don't know why. Well, this can be easily assessed. So what you make of this absolute position is within your hands in Elisa. That's cool. So, so obviously the sound vision design has its own origin. The lighting plot design has its own origin. The tracking system has an origin and we can deal with that and offset to what we need in place that real object within the real speaker system that we've designed for the day. And exactly. how we need to deal with that. That's really cool. Awesome yeah. guys. That's, that's a great tool, especially I can imagine this for a, a show with uh, 15 or 20 actors dancing around. It would be pretty hard to manually do that. So this is a, a pretty important thing to have. That's correct. So let me go back to a 2D mode. Um, so yeah, let me continue. I'm going to move now to Notch, which is uh, again, it's another software that is widely used in the live industry. So it creates, you know, like motion graphics and it's an interactive, you know, visual effects all in real time. And it looks like this guy. Um, right now it's kind of looks complicated, but it's not. Uh, I have a regular video, which uh, is this object here. It's node based as well, like maximum speed. And it's this image here, and I'm using a math modifier. You can you can actually grab objects. You can create objects from here as well, like, like max. And one of them is a math modifier. This math modifier is uh, outputting values. I'm using a perlin noise and outputting those values into a range remap, which is scaling those values uh, to zero and one. Remember, that's the um, the range that Elisa uses for for parameters. And from this scale, you're, uh, we're putting these values into an OSC object. And here, you might not be able to see it because it's really small, but I'm, that's, I'm, I wrote, I added the, the string, the address that Elisa is going to read. It says external source number three and P for pan. So if I press play, right now, my, my video movement is following my object. Sorry, again, the object is following the, the video movement. So. Again, from the visual department, you can even control um, the specialization on on Elisa because it's going to be way easier to do this, this way. You don't have to, you know, as a mixing engineer, oh, you have to follow that specific part of the video, which is, has happened before, to be honest. And this way is like more friendly. It's more, it's easier. As you can see, you can have a very uh, uh, like complex movement that you cannot track. But now with with this example, you can. Um, so Carlos, in that sense, the neat thing about this obviously is that movement could be uh, randomized based on the audio signal from a given instrument. Notch could handle that. And then it's generating a movement based on a given stimulus, which then is also triggering the visual movement and the audio movement combined. So it's all cohesive. There's nothing to, to deal with once that initial programming is done. That's correct. And it's bidirectional. We can, uh, Notch can actually read Elisa as well. So we can output movement from Elisa because the front, you know, the engineer wants to, the out engineer wants to move that object and the object needs to follow, you know, the video needs to follow as well. So it's bidirectional basically. So don't don't feel like everyone's going to control us. Now we can control other departments too, which it will make it feel like great too. Well, it's really important that the visual follows the sound, right? So sound is the thing that people really notice first, of course, and sound is most important. So the visual <laughs> should follow the sound, right? Carlos? I totally agree. I totally okay, agree. Good. We have two votes for that. Um, <laughs> can I get a? Yeah, right, excellent. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Um, OK, so besides Notch, we have Unity. Unity is, um, is a game engine. It's 
is very popular in the gaming world. And um, it's not only for games, actually. I've seen it live several times, especially for animation, when there's interaction from, you know, like from artist into the real scenario on stage, like there's, you know, visuals, there's graphics, there's something moving accordingly with, with your body movements. It, Unity can do that. What I did right now is uh, it's actually a cute Hollywood Bowl. Um, and uh, this guy here, it's kind of cute. So if I press play and I use my, my keyboard, I can control the object. Well, I can control the avatar right now that is moving and the avatar is controlling Elisa. So again, all in real time. And this is done. So I programmed this basically. Um, this is the transfer position of my avatar. So when I move it, as you can see, there's um, the position is changing that. And I'm converting that Cartesian movements into polar because that's what Elisa reads, polar uh, coordinates. So I can, again, I can control Elisa from Unity. Um, this is this is um, very useful again and for animation, animation, and there's a lot of VR done by Unity as well. And thanks to that, we can talk to Elisa. And that's so my this next. This might this might Sorry. be this might make sense, obviously, in a like a theme park setting or. Um, where you have a virtual character that's interacting dynamically with the audience. So I can imagine uh, taking my kids to a, a Disney attraction and, and the turtle's going to swim around the, the room controlled by the actor talking to the different kids. And now you can have the turtle animation move and the audio track all from the same graphics engine, right? Well, that's correct. And remember, like this, for this performances, things changes. Like maybe tomorrow, the, the designer wants, oh no, you know, I don't like, I don't like that, uh, that movement. I want to move it to somewhere else. And you don't have to reprogram everything. You can just, okay, because this is attached to that object, whatever you do with that object is going to always follow that uh, position. Which is, I mean, it's, 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 it's important. We need time, this save us time. And we don't need to re, you know, call everyone again. Hey guys, you have to come and program this. No, it's always, it's just done. Very cool. Thanks, Carlos. Um, yeah, that's Unity. If I, if we go deeper, again, I did with, uh, again, Unity can do VR as well. You can create applications. And I'm going to try this here, which it's going to, be cool. Uh, in a VR, in a virtual world, I can control objects as, as well. So it's got help me here. I'm gonna put my my VR goggles on. Oh, I have my headphones. Gonna be actually, you know what? I'm not gonna hear you for a bit. I oh, know, you know what? I can do this. Okay, so you can see the object is moving, correct? Yep, we can see that. We can see it moving so in the VR I'm world. I'm using my hands. I'm using my bare hands to control the object, and Elise has been controlled as well. So I can move the object closer, you know, make crazy movements, and the object on Elisa is gonna it's gonna follow. Not only pan again; it can be distance with all of that. So we're moving into a new dim dimension as well, the virtual world, and I found. I found like this really, really useful when you have a uh, video and 360 environments, like, a, like I actually use it for domes, where the designer provides the 360 video to me, like for me, and I can, and I have, you know, things flying around everywhere. And instead of doing, you know, automation lines and snapshots, because they are very complex and they have so many, it's easy for me to just use my bare hands and track that movement and that's already recorded in my doll. So that's that takes minutes to do. Like it's really fast. And instead of you know like creating 
from elevation to the horizontal horizontal plane, those kind of movement that involves two, uh, two, three, four parameters at the same time. I can just do it in a VR world, in a 360 environment. And um, not only that, I can experience virtual uh, uh, world with VR and real physical sources. So if, if instead of binaural, because I mean, VR worlds are, are like commonly used binaural uh, mixdowns. So what I'm trying to say is like when we have physical sources, it's a real thing. It's a real thing. If I turn to the right side, that sound is coming from the actual speaker, not coming from a simulating um, source coming from from a binaural mixdown. Uh, is yeah again this like actually needs like a I would say, I would say like I'm getting uh, can you hear that noise. OK. Cool, so yeah, that's the VR side of it. Um, I'm going to just go back to you, Fred. This is amazing, Carlos. What I'm sorry, Fred, sorry, Fred. I don't know if I need to get there. Yeah, OK. okay. My bad, my bad. Back, uh, is this clear for you? Yeah, can you hear me clear? Yeah, we got you. Yeah, we got you. OK, this is amazing, Carlos. This is a world of creativity under your hands. I mean, that virtual reality to assess mixing in a 3D dome is really astounding, really. Uh, it's it's great. Um, I'd like to just refocus on a few things. Uh, first, this. I've got this in my pocket. This is a tracker. And I have a tracking system here. So you've understood from Carlos that an object could be tracked. And it means I'm taking here the Piccolo and I'm making sure here I'm only dealing with Pan. That Pan will be from the tracker. And you know this table where you can assess that the object will be listening to Snapshot. Like if, in. If Fred, uh, uh, I share your screen, screen with us. Please, we're, we're, we're oh, sorry. Here. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, no worries. Sorry. Obviously, yes. Uh, we'll do in a second. Right, so I have this um, tracker and here in the logic board, I can decide that this Piccolo could be driven by snapshot or plugin or external OSC or tracker and I chose tracker and as you said so rightly uh, Scott there's different families of trackers some are optical very precise for videos and stuff some are RF and they wouldn't have to compete with daylight and so they get away with different challenges and also you've got uh, follow spot operators that can provide you with data and all those data can come in different protocols and we're not master of that we have to live with it but we need to assess their language into and translate their language into ours and that's exactly what we do with a little app that you come and open here the osc bridge which i have opened here and i'm going to bring it down to you the elisa osc bridge allows to translate rttpm which is black tracks or POSI stage net, which is an open protocol from the MA people, directly into OSC. And what this bridge does is you're talking RTTPM, you've got a black track, I'll translate it to, um, to your language, to the OSC language with the right address and the right grammar for every modifier. Okay, so that's done for you, that is translated. Now, if you're tracking solution is OSC, it will not require the bridge, okay? So here I've got a black tracks, so it's optical. It's very accurate. That could be also a modulo P. They're doing an extremely good job at precision too. So instead of being on the snapshot here for this object, I'm gonna be on the tracker and I want to see whether this object is moving. So I'm moving away from you. And you can see that this green object is 
moving accordingly. Okay, so my position is reflected in the uh, parameters of the object. Now that's good. We know that we're sending data. And Carlos has often said that things were bilateral. Okay, so here in this session, if I go to my settings, I not only have a tracking, I have a desk link engaged, right? And here we can see that the desk link is active with the Digico that's under my hand. Right, so that means now that the Digico, as you've understood, and the PM Yamaha can do that too, will be a remote controller for the um, for the parameters. So now it means that if I'm I'm going to change cameras, if you can bear with me for a second, and hope you can see this. I'm on the desk itself, right? And I'm gonna try to see the best of it. Okay. And now, if I take the piccolo, which is here, and reveal the parameters, you can see that it's got pan, width, distance, elevation, and oxygen. But see, if I move my tracker, the desk is actually by desk link, reflecting this move as was the soundscape so we now have not only a two-way communication we have a three-way communication this becomes really a clever uh, cake a multi-layer cake and i like cakes especially today <laughs> uh, but now more so i have a tracker desk link is showing me the motion on the desk but i would like to record that motion. I would like to do, because we're doing a rehearsal today, but tomorrow will be the show and I would like to play with things again. Well, here I've got my Reaper session here. And I'm just going to show you, I've got an empty track here with a plugin, which is a control source plugin here. And I chose here in this list to be controlling the piccolo, right? When I say controlling, it's not really what it is, because to be controlling the piccolo, I would need to go in the sources here and tell it, you listen to the plugin for the pan now, not the tracker, but I don't want this. I still want to track my object. In Reaper or in any doll, it's it's just Reaper I have here. This is the plugin, and if the plugin automation is engaged, like here, I'm going to make it write automation for pan, and that's the only one I'm going to be dealing with today. If I play, then now if I move. You can see that the automation lane is actually creating some data. So not only do I have a one, two, three, that's my fourth layer for the cake. And so automation has written the motion of the tracker. So that means tomorrow morning when the, when the band or the show is not on yet, I can play back the audio. I can use the automation written off the tracker into the plugin and just play back audio and position as they played it live during the show. Now there's one thing Carlos I need you for is this one thing our friends have to know is the logic board here within Elisa is built per session. So if I choose object one is following the tracker for pan. That's what it's going to be for the show. Unless I manually change it and it could be a problem. So um, can you help me with that? Can, can my object be suddenly following a plugin? Can it then be following a tracker and then OSC? How should I do that? Well, guess what? Uh, we can send OSC to change control sources, which is uh, very useful because, yeah, as you mentioned, like maybe at this point I want 
to control parameter. Uh, I want to control a parameter via plugin, but for the you know for the chorus or for the second song or for whatever, I want to control parameter using an external OSC. And let me show you that this quickly. Um, let me. Uh, so you're seeing my screen? Yep, we got you. Um, so here in Pro Tools, um, I'm using program changes right now to send um, control flag information. So the MIDI program changes are being converted into OSC, so I can actually work on, on my DAW. For this, the first part of my song, I want to control um, my this specific object with uh, snapshots. So if I play from here, you're gonna see here number two. So if I'm playing from here, we have so many screens running right now. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to find my pro. Okay. So I'm going to trigger my snapshot two from here. It went to snapshot two. Now I'm going to go to snapshot one. Again, I'm controlling snapshot, but I'm going to now use this program change to control uh, to go from snapshot to plugin because I'm using plugins here. So you're going to see a change in my scope. Uh, do you see it? Nope. Okay, I'll do it again. So these objects, um, the Pro Tools one, are going to go from pan to plugin here or timeline based. You know, so right now I was, sorry, I was in a snapshot first and now for this bit, I'm controlling plugin. Basically. That's really cool. So Carlos, you can automate the control flag information via OSC for any parameter within Elisa for any object. So that means I could, for instance, write a macro button on my desk that maybe disables trackers on everything in case something goes crazy and it's one button press and it switches everybody off of tracking, correct? That's correct. Now, and, and Fred and Carlos, maybe you guys can answer this for me. Um, what we're choosing in Elisa is what we're listening to, but we're always broadcasting out all this information to everybody. So we're always broadcasting out the pan with distance values to every plugin, everything. So we could have every other device record the information, but we're just going to choose at what time we're listening to what. Yes, that's exactly what it is. The logic board is meant for that is what do we listen to with broadcasts we can record on osc recorders we can record on on plugins but what are we listening to is the key question when you render your show and that's exactly what you define in this uh, logic table in the in the controller really so um maybe two more things we mentioned objects we always talked about objects as single objects as one channel object as a mono object well a mono object a, can be one source me singing in a mic or a sum of sources 20 singers from a choir into a single output but it needn't be only mono as you've seen last time and you can you'll be able to see this in a second on my screen here, I've created a stereo keyboard, and you remember a stereo object as a pan. It has width, it has distance, but it also has. Frederick, you want to share your screen one more time? If you are, I'm sure you're in the process of it. Um, we just have no. your beautiful, uh, beautiful face there, and only. All right, that's not what I meant. Okay. So I've created this stereo object here, right? And yeah. you remember we had pan, we had width we could play with, we had distance, we had elevation, but there was one more parameter, which was pan spread, which allowed you to keep the center weight of your object in its position. It remains zero, 
but just open up your object. And that is something that comes extra. So if you want to do this, it's going to be in Elisa. So we had this mono object. So this was my piccolo in my pants in my pan range. But now if I have a stereo object here, it's going to be another display. Slightly larger. Well, what it shows is two objects, then you can spread them from the, the plugin. You can pan them accordingly and that you can see that they follow both of them are following then width would be the same. And as we do in the controller, you can actually break the pair momentarily to decide that you want more width on one of the objects and maybe more distance on one of them and then relink them and you can write automation like that. It's as easy as that, okay? Now, it would be the same in the desk link. So if I switch this, and I hope you can see clear, this is my desk link, and I've, I've uh, selected my, my keyboard here, and my keyboard in the desk link shows as two rows. I've got the top row, which is the main one you see. The knobs are bigger. That's because things are linked. So if I unlink them from here, then they've got the same size and you can do those offsets as you would on the plugin. So already you can control stereo objects, but you can also control objects that are way beyond two channels. If you are being given a, a, a 16 channel output from a, a certain format, you never know. Then what you do is you'd probably create a group and here I get a pan, a width, a distance, an elevation and a pan spread. And each one of the outputs, say you take an LCR or a surround, LCR plus surround, that would be five objects. And those five objects would be contributing to your global soundscape. So here, if you have a look, I've selected the full strings and I've got here a snapshot with my full screen strings spreaded, okay? So if you can see them, here on the desk and back on the desk, I've got a spread for them. And in real time from the mixing position, I can change the actual horizontal width of the ensemble. And I can change this, but it would work similarly if I was in a plugin. So back there, I'm neglecting this one. And what I want to show you is here, plugin can also work with groups. Oh, sorry. First, I have a group called full string. So here in the administration tab, I'll select the group and say, I want to take control over the group. And I'm gonna take control from the plugin with pan and distance, just to make it easy. So I've got here the plugin. It's going to control and in the drop down menu, you're gonna to have to select full string. And now you have a crescent that shows you the actual width of your group. And you're going to be able to expand it or maybe pan it or maybe add some distance to it. Oh, I didn't select distance, so it's grayed out three. So, and you're going to be able to write these automation here. Maybe from here, well, I'm just going to check that it's going to write automation so I'd like to write automation and now if i play it then from this group i can here write very intuitively some automation here or i could do it from the plugin and write the relevant automation here. And that will be shown here. Oh. Yep, 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 yep. It's under here. That's showed here. The motions are created oh, here. And you're controlling 
a whole bunch of objects. So say if you've got a 20.2 format that's coming in, in, in a dome and you have to play around with it, well, then create 22 object, create a group, and you can play around with it. And that's with the automation, so that's real time, or that can be from your desk with desk link and more. Okay, so um, this is it for, for now. So I'd like to just sum up quickly what we've been seeing today, uh, if that's all right with you, um, Scott. Yeah, I think that's great. I think uh, obviously we've we've gone deep into a lot of the advanced capabilities of mixing in Elisa, and I really like at the end here you you kind of explained um, how everything can be connected at the same time, and we can change control. How Carlos explained we can change control with OSC logic. Um, so I guess what should we use when? I mean, is there is there a, maybe a right tool for a given moment in time? Right. The first thing we need to understand is how the hierarchy of the tools are made. And here we've got the Elysia controller, right, with the, a trunk containing the object position. And those object position will be given as metadata by, by different talkers. The first one would be the soundscape, or it could be uh, the uh, snapshot engine, but the soundscape will, no, no, it's only the soundscape, sorry, that will give the primary information and whatever you program, snapshot, uh, tracking or whatever, if you grab an object within the soundscape, you will stop any motion that was rendered and you will be taken over. So the Elisa controller, the soundscape window has the top priority and that is very important to understand. So direct action from mouse or touch screen in the controller will take over anything that's existing. Now, your second level of uh, hierarchy would be the desk link uh, if it is engaged, because you've understood that desk link is really a remote to the controller. Then the third level, if activated, would be the other means. And the other means would be the snapshot engine, would be the plugin, would be the OSC uh, means, anything you've programmed, or the tracking device. And all this sends to the controller position that will be rendered by the um, processor. Now, there's another factor that you need to understand is exclusivity. For the external, there's an exclusive factor. Say, pan on my Piccolo could be given by a tracking device but in which case it wouldn't be given nor by OSC, nor by plugin, nor by snapshot. We would be, as you so rightly said, Scott, listening to the tracker. So it's really an exclusive choice that you make in the logic board of the controller. And just to show you quickly here, on the top bar, you select for every object. So if, if I click here, elevation will be controlled for from snapshot for all existing objects. And here, the oxend would be controlled by OSC. But here, pan and distance for flute number four would then be controlled from a tracker. Whereas pan for object number two would be controlled by a plugin. And because also there's a plugin enabled for it, and it shows here on the indicator. A bit more. You can suddenly decide you're not listening to any external uh, modifier, and that's isolate. Now, flute one is isolated. I'm not listening to any of those guys. I'm leaving the flute number one in the state it was when I in, when an instantiated isolate. So if it was 10 degree in pan, uh, zero width and 40% of distance, that's what it would be and it would be still. The second way to ignore listening to some modifiers is safe. Here on object number two, I chose to not change width and distance anymore. And you can see that they were chosen to be controlled by the snapshot, but they're now dark green so we're not listening to them anymore. But if I release this, it will automatically go back to snapshot. 
That's very important to understand. Now, as you asked, which control for what usage, which tool are you going to use to achieve what? Okay. If you're going to do some object position control, then the soundscape, the snapshots, will be position giver, position controller. Remember, Elisa controller is your gateway to the processor. You can have desk link and follow along panning or adding um, parameters. That could be from a doll or that could be from trackers or OSC or show control. Now more, I want a live interaction during the show. I can choose an object and you know it has top priority within the, the controller and it will move accordingly to my needs. That can be done also because you know this desk is a remote because it's desk link enabled. It's a remote to the various parameters so I can grab a panel like I would on any a traditional show and change it, whatever parameter that's inside the, uh, the, the session for the relevant object. And you could have OSC also to change some parameters in real time. And of course, if it's a direct live interaction, tracking will bring you visual in phase with your audio. What you see is what you hear. Now, if you want to update your soundscape, the first thing you're going to use is snapshots, be it from the controller or from the desk if you chose to do your snapshots from the desk because you want some scoping. If you're going to create simple linear trajectories, then your first call could be the Elysian controller and use snapshot with crossfade because you know it will be a very gentle move from one state to the next one. But that could also be show control. You program some moves, you just trigger them. Or you could have written some simple linear curves into a show control program. You can do that in QLab especially. I mean, there's many ways. If you're going to create complex trajectory, then your choice are different. It could be the doll, but that means it's time-based. We need some timing running. We need a tape running. We need a multi-track running. So that's time-based. We're writing uh, parameters against time. But for complex trajectory, you could also use OSC and program some complex trajectory. Hervé de Jardin from Molecule is actually using using and has pre-programmed some fancy moves, written very complex move that he can trigger in one go. If it's show control, and as Carlos showed you, you're going to modify the logic board. You're going to do some deep programming. Remember that your controller speaks OSC natively, so OSC with show control software will be your best choice. So now it's showtime. Showtime means that in your session, let me remind you, you're going to press live on air here in this corner, and you remember doing so. There's no more solo in place from the uh, controller, and there's no more. Uh, oops, let me undo this. There's no more initializing on a parameter, so you're safe and you're good to go and you're good to be creative with the tools we've described to you today. So these notions are quickly gathered, notions excerpted from the, uh, extracted from the Elisa tra seminar training which is a three-day seminar. And what you have to understand is um, there's a lot of notions that are being uh, covered in this. And this is worth for mixing engineers. This is worth for a um, uh, system engineer, but this could also be worth for sound designer too. And we here cover some common grounds for both tracks here with Elisa's full system approach, Elisa controller and object-based mixing, then dynamic mixing, and then we take different paths. 
system engineers will go to loud system design and loud system implementation and calibration, whereas show designers or a mixing engineer will go through a mixing workshop to get some deep learning of how to mix an object base and obtain the result they are looking for with the right tool. And then we gather everyone here in this single uh, afternoon where we talk about project management and workflow. But moreover, we're really gathering both teams, the system team and the mixing team, because they really must have a strong interaction. What the system team does wrong will make the, the Elisa mix not happen. What the system guys do so well, and I know there's many of them that have already started on this path, and will only help the mixing people, but you have to let know the mixing people about the dimensions of your system, about some things you really have to pay attention to. And so this is really a two-man job and it is really a strongly communicating um, team that needs to be set up. So um, that's what we do in, in the seminars. So it's going to start soon, as soon as the confinement is over. Yeah, I, I bet you know that. And uh, so uh, what you want to do is actually to get more information is either log on to the El Acoustics um, website uh, at training slash Elisa or send us an email at training at El Acoustics dot com come and learn come and have fun come and be creative with us it's amazing well frederick thank you for for all of that um and obviously you guys uh, uh tomorrow we've got a presentation if you're going to join us where we have a great systems engineer and a great mix engineer we're going to talk all about their experience with Elisa. Um, Carlos has actually produced a video as well that'll be online on YouTube. If you're watching this on YouTube, it's probably online right now. If you're watching us live uh, on the internet today on Thursday, it'll be up momentarily. So please check out that video. It's a great way to talk about music production using all of these tools in Elisa. Um, that'll be up online shortly as well. Frederick, if you want to flip your camera, I think we switched to the desk one more time. Um, I really sure. appreciate um, uh, you joining us today. Um, it's uh, it's uh, 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 been great explaining all these deep concepts that you've done. Um, so thank you for that as well. I think we're still seeing the desk there, my friend. I'm, I'm on my way. Uh, I just had to run from the desk to you. So now here I am. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you for uh, thank you for today. It is uh, it's an important day, obviously, to teach everyone about dynamic mixing. But more importantly, I believe you are 4010 today. So thank you um, for taking your birthday. Um, to let the whole Internet know uh, if you guys are live out there at home, um, join along with all of us. Uh, there's a bunch of us here. We're going to sing happy birthday to Frederick. Uh, so make sure everyone unmute your mics. Carlos, you ready? Yeah. Yeah. Happy birthday to you. 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 Happy Interesting. Thank you, uh, guys. With, with that fantastic ending, we should go. Frederick, have a great rest of your birthday. Have a bottle of a uh, nice glass of rosé tonight, and everyone will see you tomorrow. Be safe, be healthy. We will talk to you soon. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.